ranga manaki tanga o tēnei rā paki ki a tātou katoa. Koutou kua haramai tapeti, koutou kua haramai tata nau mai, haramai whakatau mai. Ki roto nei i te uma o te whare wānanga o tāmaki makaurau, a ki tēnei hui nui o tātou e kihia nei ko te New Zealand Sustainable Development Goals Summit nau mai, haramai whakatau mai. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the University of Auckland. Uh, so that you might feel uh, appropriately acknowledged and welcomed uh, in what is uh, the, uh, the epicentre of, uh, of history here in the city of Auckland, uh, I would now like to invite uh, Deputy Pro Vice Chancellor Te Kaiarataki of the University of Auckland, uh, Mr. Michael Steedman, on behalf of his own people, Ngāti Whātua, the mana whenua of, of ta this part of Tamaki Makaurau, and on behalf of the University of Auckland, uh, to welcome us all this morning. Kayakwe Kara. Atanate Mara, Tenata Takato, Maku took it to Karakia, Timata Tatape, Itine Yata, Narare Kaino Tato, let us pray. The Honore Kuri Tatsu, Mamarum, the Fino Fukaro fighting Atana Tatsu, Hane Tatsu, Hemaka Mahaki. Katai, Irunita Kaipapa, Ote Neira. Yat Fakatongi at Oweiru Tapu, Hea, Fina Heto Hutu, Via Mate, Irote Tine Mahi, Menama Hikato, Tiko here in your Mate, Tukuhim Kitinewa, Mera Wa Heramayan, Manaki Hoki, O Mate Fana, Noho Sunu, Katariana, Momate, Kitoki at Kerato, Yatsu Night Kahamit Kuru, Yakot, Tunuat. Yahate Hawe Wara Mai, Evo Wara Mai. It's you here, Aki, it's you here. Nana Yamati Pupataraki Hikuta. It's Kinazi to go to go to Kaifu Karakasuki to Watamata, a Yoku Wairangi, the Hewa Mariura. Yakunui, Yakurahi, Yaku Waka Pito Hakaraya, the Remaine, Rumiakanga, Nui, or the Watamata, no Maharama to Katai. No Mairo to attain the Fario Tato, Rumitawana and Nay, away for Katai Matara. Kiana te kōrero, wai papa te whenua taumatarau te tihi o ngā whai mātauranga i ngā tauira me ngā kaimahi rotu i tēnei wānau o tātou a nau mai. Haramai i runga te karanga o tēnei ata, te kaupapa nui nui, te manaki tanga tō tātou Matuanuku me ngā mea katoa kua puta. Haramai. Whakatau. I moe i te karanga o tātou, te mana whenua o konei, ngā te whātou o rākau, tū tonu ki te taha o taku hoa, ta whananga tanga o ngā te pāwa, e mei atu ki a koutou ki tēnei ata, whakatau mai. Tua tahi, wehe ki tātou, koe te tīmata tanga me te hako tisinga o ngā mea katsoa, ko te tua rua, e anō toki whakaaro, ki te kainga tawhitoa, ko te kai te whero whero, ko te te wai a puke kāroa, me tōna mokopuna noho tunu ki te lewa ki Aishitaki, e rūti tērā wāhi a Rarotonga, te mata te kingi te heitia, me ngātu ki aia, noho anei e ta hurewa tapu, ngā rātu katoe te kāhui rātu āriki, te aki i aia ki te lewa. Maria mai a kaute tili āhua tanga ki te tūhono nā ko tanga o tēnei wāhi o tātou, ko te reo uroa o te kahi o ngā ingoa, me tēnei wāhi o tātou ta amuki hiri ngā waka. Ngā mata katoa, haere, haere, haere atu rā. Ka piti hono tātai hono, te hunga mata ki te hunga mata i a piti hono tātai hono. Tātou te hunga ora, tēnā koutou katoa. Nō ki te hono re, ki te tuku mihi ki au koutou, tō tāinga mai i roti te kaupapa nei, te kaupapa rangatira nei, te teakitanga o te whenua, teakitanga o te wai, teakitanga o ngā mea katoa, ke wainga nui e rangi nui ngā whatutunuku, e mihi atu ki au koutou, ngā rangatira katoa. Tiki ana ki te mihi ki a koe, te tūmua ki tu arua, mai AUT, Jeff, tō tāinga mai, ka rangatiri tēnei koe kota, tēnā koe. Te a koe hoki, te mata mō mātou, tēnei wānanga, Damon, tō e sulu sulu, nau mai hara mai, ki tō whare, tēnā koe, tāinga mai ki te haka rangatiri te kaupapa nei. Ki a koe hoki, te pirimia, Helen, Tō tāhenga mai, te mārai kura, ki te whakarangasira anō, tēnei kaupapa mō tātou. Kauta katoa nā rangasira, kauta katoa nā kaimanaki, kauta katoa nā kaitiaki, 
Good morning, everybody, uh, and it's my privilege to offer these words of welcome to you all here today. Those of you, as Jeremy said, that have come from not too far, and those of you that have come from afar, join with us here today, together today uh, under this um, particular kaupapa of particular importance to us here, uh, not just here in this part of the world, but uh, for the rest of the globe too. So I want to acknowledge you all um, in the work that you play, uh, role that you play already in this space. Uh, I want to acknowledge the work that you're going to do with this wānanga that we're going to have in our space here. Uh, I mentioned in my kōrero, um, an old prophecy from Auckland. Those of you that have listened to Ngāti Kātua speakers would have heard this often, but uh, those of you that are new, um, the prophecy talked about the, the arrival of something new and wondrous upon the North Wind. And we equate that to a pūpūtara, a nautilus shell. Um, it was taken as a good omen, it was uttered back in the late 1600s, and we get offer these words to you today too, to acknowledge uh, the contribution that you can bring to this sort of situation as well. So, <coughs> just know that uh, the words that I offer to you have been offered from my uh, sukuna, uh, from my elders as well, from my people back home, but also on behalf of the University of Auckland, so I'd like to acknowledge uh, Amon Salisa, representing the university here today, um, in uh, Jeff Dahorangi from uh, AUT as well, um, standing in for us today and uh, ensuring that you're well looked after um, as a group throughout this paper. But it's a long day, a lot of order to come, and so in the words of the North here, Nafi Pai Dina Moku, that's enough from me. Um, and I'll cut myself off there because I'm running out of small jokes. <laughs> So feel, feel free to uh, uh, make sure you do laugh throughout the course of today too, even though it's a of, uh, quite a heavy cope of that we're talking about, uh, but we get the opportunity to talk about our future too. So uh, with that, kei te mihi ki a koutou katoa, no ka no te honori, te karakihia e nei kutu mo tātou, a tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, a tēnā koutou katoa. So with that too, just because usually as you go through Kōwhiri, you would know that the, the speeches are followed by a waiata, um, let's all stand and sing Kaoroha. <laughs> I'd like to thank Michael for being here with us this morning, uh, not just as our Deputy Pro Vice Chancellor Māori, but also as a representative from his people, Ngāti Whātua Orake. And if these trees go missing at some point during the day, just go up to Orake, because Mike was eyeing them up before, and I, hear, I think he thought they might look quite good on the, the forecourt of his marae, uh, the, 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 the gathering place of his people, Ngāti Whātua. So we'll keep an eye on the, these trees. Um, it's cool having Mike here this morning. Uh, Mike and I often um, tag team these sorts of events. Usually um, I do the prayer and he does the mihi. Uh, and um, so today I think I've drawn the short straw because I'm your MC for the whole day. So um, I suspect you'll get quite sick of my voice uh, by the end of the day, but we'll do as much as we can to, in, uh, uh, to, 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 to lubricate today's proceedings with a few laughs here and there. 
Ai e tautoka nga ngā mihi a tō tātou rangatira ki ākoe e te pēmi a tawhito a Aotearoa e te whaia e Helen, nau mai hoki mai ki tā ngai whare wānanga, ka tira ki ākoe te rangatira e Jeff, toe o sulusu e mihi ana ki a kōrua tahi, e whakakano hi nei, wā tātou whare wānanga. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, again to our wonderful summit. And Mike had us singing, and you weren't expecting that, but that's okay, because in that wonderful waiata, uh, we, uh, we utter the words aroha, whakapono uh, and rangimārie, love, compassion, faith and, and, and peace. And so perhaps at some point, maybe those, those three kupu, those three words might be added to our sustainable development goals. I don't know, Mike, we'll make a bid for that, eh? Inject a little bit of real Māori in there. We're on the, we're on the cusp of te wiki o te reo Māori anyway, so perhaps that's appropriate. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome again. Um, we're going to um, cover off a little bit of housekeeping very briefly, but before we do, um, I'd like to thank um, our summit sponsors uh, for their um, magnanimous and, and generous support. Uh, and in particular, we'd like to thank um, our gold sponsor, APS, our silver sponsors, uh, New Zealand Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade, uh, the New Zealand Commission of UNESCO, and our bronze sponsors, BECA, Moxie, uh, and Massey University, um, and also our media partners and associates also. Um, in the case of an emergency, there are exits here on that side and, and the doors through which you entered also. To be honest, I don't even know where those exits go to, so, um, so good luck with that. Um, if you're like my aunties from up north, and you like to routinely light candles for world peace. Um, this is a non-smoking campus, uh, but you're welcome to make your way down uh, to the end of, um, of, of Wyndham Street here beyond the Marae, uh, where in all truth you actually might find some cigarette butts already in those bushes out there from uh, attendees at the various uh, hui at that facility. So uh, feel free to make your way down there. Um, uh, now, they're, 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 you'll be aware that there is a summit app from which you can extract all sorts of um, interesting bits of information and, and directions to guide you throughout the day, so um, uh, get onto that app. Um, and if uh, you're looking for, uh, there was a slide back here, detailing um, uh, the, the uh, URA guest Wi-Fi um, uh, username and password, uh, feel free to access that also. Although no Netflix, all right. We're on a limited um, uh, bandwidth here at the university. And if at all you're feeling dissatisfied about any of um, today's conference, uh, the food or any other aspect, um, come and see me about it and I'll make sure that your complaint is, is elevated right up to the highest of heavens and from there it can be dealt with. Uh, before we um, uh, come to our, our, our first um, our first session for this morning. Uh, we are fortunate also to have uh, two of our uh, supporting universities' uh, highest officials, two of our, our, our big chiefs from both this university and uh, the fine university across the road from us, our brothers and sisters at AUT. Um, and so our universities are going to formally welcome us this morning. And uh, representing uh, the University of Auckland, uh, we have Associate Professor uh, Damon Salesa, um, uh, who is our Pro Vice Chancellor Pacifica. Uh, and from AUT, uh, we have also Professor Jeff Perry, who is the Acting Vice Chancellor of AUT currently. Uh, I now invite uh, Jeff and Damon to welcome us formally on behalf of the University of Auckland and AUT. Nemai hari mai, malo sufu malangi mama, malo lei mo kai ngatonga, malo lei kau me kau me mea me taka koto ma mani. Tali tali nei kia kia kimo tolo ki e o tu aloha ko tonga ni. Kau ma foki fanga tu poanga me moa kuno. Kei ia e ki nau taulo, 
Kato e melino mo e tonu hia. Me moto tai kaina ko ata ki mo kakai e wiha. That second part is not my language, but it's an important week in New Zealand. As of yesterday, it is Tongan Language Week, and that was a welcome to you. And the Tongan language, which is a language of my household, but not mine, I'm married to a Tongan. And it's an important place to start because this Auckland and both our universities are located here in one of the world's most Pacific cities. We are surrounded by the Pacific. Uh, we belong to the Pacific. And so, of course, what you gather to talk about today has an enormous impact on our part of the world. Sustainability not just of islands, which are already facing challenges, but sustainability of the people, the ways of being, their cultures, and as it's obvious a sign from God, their languages, which we celebrate in New Zealand. So I welcome you with this question of sustainability at the front of your mind and the global sustainability development goals, which provide this comprehensive and broad framework to guide action. We know they've been agreed to by 194 countries. The goals encompass people, planet, prosperity, peace, partnership, water, land. They focus on how to address the world's greatest challenges and have set the UN's international community's agenda for the next 20 years. As universities which are institutional members of the UN instigated Sustainable Development Solutions Network, we recognise that the main contributions to the SDGs are in building knowledge for sustainability, educating the leaders of our future, and also in modelling sustainable practices. We are very proud, and I'll confess a little surprised, to discover in the first overall rankings of the inaugural Times Higher Education Impact Rating that we were assessed alongside 450 universities from 76 countries against the number of SDGs. We were ranked first in health and wellbeing, first equal in partnerships for the goals, sixth equal in gender equality, and seventh in peace, justice, and strong institutions. We placed in the first 20 in other categories, including sustainable cities and communities, quality education, decent work and ethnic growth, economic growth, and reduced inequalities. We were proud of this, but we recognised there's really only one direction to go when you're number one. The university takes enormous pressure, uh, pleasure in welcoming such a diverse range of you today. These include people from central and local government, Māori, Pacifica, community groups, NGOs, businesses, colleagues from our eight New Zealand universities, and we are so delighted to see so many young people here today. With delegates, we wish you all the best in sharing your knowledge and experience, and in working together to build action plans to accelerate the progress on these important issues together. For me, the urgency comes directly out of our part of the world. On campus, between AUT's campus and ours, we have something like six and a half thousand young Pacific students. <clears throat> Most of them trace their genealogies to places who will be the first to feel so many of the effects, effects if we get it wrong. We live in a part of the world which is one third of the Earth's surface and often neglected in the way that the world sees itself. For me, an important journey to the SDGs is to share that recognition that the Pacific isn't at the margins of global change or a canary in the gold mine. The Pacific is the battleground for our future. Um, and with that, I wish you all the best um, on these incredible deliberations and welcome up my colleague from the Auckland University of Technology, Jeff Perry. Tēnā katoa and, and, and welcome to everyone who is here today. 
Malo Elele. It is Tongan Language Week. So happy Tongan Language Week. To mark this year's Tongan Language Week, AUT released a video on social media last night that features Liz, a young Tongan AUT alumna who is doing amazing work with her small not-for-profit company, One for Worth, in partnership with a South Auckland-based social enterprise called Affirming Works. Ever since the Sustainable Development Goals were adopted in 2015, AUT has been using the seven Pacific Language Weeks here in New Zealand as a vehicle to showcase work being done by our students, staff and alumni to address the various, the various global challenges highlighted by the SDGs. These videos together have already amassed close to one million views. Choosing our Pacific Language Weeks as a vehicle to address SDGs is no accident. For us, it locates our focus to where we are in the world. We live in a region where many of our Pacific neighbours are already experiencing many, if not most, of the negative impacts of the challenges and issues highlighted by the SDGs. We live in a country whose Prime Minister only two weeks ago joined other Pacific leaders of our region at the 50th Pacific Islands Forum in Tuvalu, where they collectively, and I quote, reaffirmed climate change as the single greatest threat to the livelihoods, security and well-being of the peoples of the Pacific. And I remind us that that includes New Zealand. We live in a city that is not only becoming more Pacific by the hour, as pointed out by my fellow host, uh, PBC Damon Salesa, in his recent book, but is also a city in which the divide between prosperity and poverty is growing wider and deeper by the hour. Where much of that poverty is spatially located in five of the six local boards that constitute South Auckland. I work at a university that close to 10 years ago built a campus in the heart of Monaco to offer a tangible and accessible pathway out of poverty for South Auckland communities. I also work at a university where today one in every five of our domestic students come from neighbourhoods that have a score of nine or ten on the New Zealand Deprivation Index. We don't have to look very far to find poverty and deprivation in our neighbourhood. So it is no accident that over the last three years we have used our Pacific Language Weeks as a vehicle to highlight the challenge laid down by the SDGs. However, it is an accident, albeit an opportune one, that this year's overarching focus for our Pacific Language Weeks is SDG 17, Partnership for the Goals. Indeed, a lack of cohesive collective responsibility and effort seems to pose the greatest threat to us to achieving our targets by 2030, whether it be on a multilateral level between nations, as highlighted by our keynote speaker, the Right Honourable Alan Clark in her recent Peter Fraser lecture in Wellington, or at a collaborative level between large organisations and entities like universities. Each of our respective universities have developed sustainability plans. Last year, we at AUT launched our sustainability roadmap, developed by the Vice-Chancellor's task force, chaired by Professor Thomas Nietzsche, and consisting of students and staff. Each of our universities thus have actions and initiatives in place and have academic staff and postgraduate students who, through their research, will contribute many solutions to the various challenges highlighted by the SDGs. However, there is clearly a growing sense that collective, bolder and more courageous and selfless action is needed, as reflected in the theme for the summit, Accelerated Action Together. Our two universities jointly hosting the summit is an important first step in this collective action. However, more is needed. What is clear is that a much tighter partnership between our institutions to lend our collective and considerable heft as large organisations in our city, working with the stakeholder groups, many of whom are in the room today, is both timely and required so that we can together address the iniquities of our neighbourhood and the SDGs. I'm reminded of an old proverb attributed to the Greeks, 
which I will paraphrase and adapt for today's occasion. Society will only be sustained if its people collectively plant trees under whose shade they know they shall never sit. Let's all plant those trees. Mala or Pito. Thank you both for the formal welcome on behalf of our host universities this morning. Uh, prepare your popcorn and your drinks, ladies and gentlemen. We have uh, the Prime Minister soon to appear via a video, uh, the Right Honourable Jacinda Ardern, uh, recorded uh, this presentation um, uh, of New Zealand's first voluntary national review on sustainable development goals. Uh, to the United Nations in July this year, and we have uh, her video to play for us. Kia ora koutou katoa, he waka eke noa, which means towards a better future together. Together is an important word for us in New Zealand. It says a, a shared vision. It puts the people at the heart of policy decisions. It's about building you know, a happy, healthy, prosperous New Zealand, which everyone can benefit from. Togetherness is the core of our strategy to deliver well-being and recognises that the spheres of our lives, our environment, our people, our economy, are interconnected and interdependent. These same principles lie at the heart of the Sustainable Development Goals. I'm proud to present New Zealand's first voluntary national review on progress towards the Sustainable Development Goals. The report is a demonstration, I hope, of our strong commitment to the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. New Zealand, as many know, is richly blessed as a nation. We have tremendous physical and human resources. We are a diverse and agile nation. We are innovative and resilient. But we also have our share of challenges. And one of these is to ensure that all New Zealanders achieve a decent standard of living and have a strong sense of well-being. Leaving no one behind requires openness and honesty about the challenges we face. And it is an approach we've brought to our first review of the Sustainable Development Goals and to our domestic agenda. As we transition to a sustainable, productive and inclusive economy, we do require a deeper understanding of the groups who will be most affected so that we can ensure the right strategies are in place to support them. It does require us to do things differently. It requires solid, disaggregated data to base decisions on. And we've developed a new suite of statistical indicators. They're called Indicators Aotearoa New Zealand. They go beyond economics to incorporate social, cultural and environmental measures. The indicators will provide a clear picture of New Zealand's overall wellbeing as well as a measure of our progress towards the Sustainable Development Goals. Alongside this, we have developed a new analytical framework that emphasises the diversity of outcomes meaningful for New Zealanders. This Living Standards Framework, as it's called, will be part of our toolkit to analyse and assess policy options that enhance wellbeing and support New Zealand's achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. New Zealand is strongly committed to being a leader and a constructive partner nationally and internationally in the global effort to create a more sustainable and inclusive economy. We recognise that all sustainable development goals are connected and cannot be achieved by governments alone. This report, I hope, also highlights our government's priorities, including working towards eradicating poverty, improving mental health, addressing inequalities, thriving in a digital age and transitioning to a low emission sustainable economy. These initiatives are crucial to achieving the sustainable development goals. And we know the cumulative value of small incremental steps, the day-to-day -day decisions and actions that we make a difference and change people's lives. We have seen and heard inspiring stories of what New Zealanders are doing already and we want to bring all New Zealanders, regardless of their circumstances or experience, along with us on the journey. In the spirit of Goal 17, we are committed to partnership. Partnership with Māori, the Indigenous people of New Zealand, and partnerships with communities, with business, and with our international friends. 
We've made a good start. Our challenge is to continue this momentum together. He woke eke noa. And the Prime Minister will be watching uh, what happens today via social media, so she'll be glad to know that her, her video received such warm applause. Kwa tai tātou ki te taumatatuatahi mō te nira. We come now to um, today's first actual session. Uh, te āhua te wahi me te whaipango o Aotearoa hei arahi. Uh, the international context uh, and New Zealand's leadership role uh, within that context. Um, and uh, it is uh, our great pleasure uh, to welcome uh, back to a place uh, with which she is greatly familiar and a place which is greatly familiar uh, with her. Um, right Honourable uh, Helen Clark, <coughs> et fire the Premier Tafito, uh, no mai hoki mai ki tō whare wānanga. Uh, Helen Clark was Prime Minister of New Zealand for three successive terms uh, from 1999 to 2008. Uh, she was the first woman to become Prime Minister following a general election in New Zealand and the second woman to serve as Prime Minister. Uh, throughout her tenure uh, and as a Member of Parliament for 27 years, Helen engaged widely in policy development and advocacy across the economic, social environmental and cultural spheres. Uh, she advocated strongly for a comprehensive program on sustainable, sustainability for New Zealand and for tackling the challenges of climate change. She was an active leader of her country's foreign relations, engaging in a wide range of international issues. In 2009, Helen became administrator of the United Nations Development Program. She was the first woman to lead the organization and served two terms there while also chairing the United Nations Development Group. Helen continues to speak widely and be a strong voice on sustainable development, climate action, gender equality, and women's leadership, peace and justice, and action on non-communicable diseases and HIV. She serves on a number of boards and commissions, including the advisory board of the Global Education Monitoring Report, uh, the board of the Executive Industries Transparency Initiative and the Board of the Partnership of Maternal, Newborn and Child Health. Nō reira, hō mai te pakipaki mō tēnei ariki kwa hoki mai ki roti a tātou. Ladies and gentlemen, the Right Honourable Helen Clark, who is our keynote speaker for this morning's session. Ena iwi nga te whātua, ena iwi o te motu, ena reo, ena mana, ena rangatira mā tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. And malo e la lei to Tongan Language Week. Talo falafa, whakalofa lahi atu, ki o rana ni sambula vanaka. Warm Pacific greetings to you all. And good to be here to make some opening remarks on this session at the conference on the international context of the Sustainable Development Goals. I'm going to focus my comments mainly on the international uh, context, but let's note at the outset what you all know, which is that the Sustainable Development Goals and Agenda 2030 are a universal agenda, meaning they apply from uh, Somalia and Kazakhstan to New Zealand and uh, Canada. Uh, it was expected when leaders signed off on them at the 2015 summit at the UN in New York uh, that they would make serious efforts when they got back home to do something about them. The truth is, as I'll say in my remarks, that the international context is a little depressing on a number of scores at the present time. Uh, however, uh, this agenda is the right one, it's the right direction, the goals are good, the targets are good, there are rather a lot of them, uh, but if we stuck with it, we would have a, a transformed and uh, much uh, uh, more inclusive and sustainable uh, uh, world than we, we have today. Uh, so the development of the SDGs uh, came out of the Rio Plus 20 uh, conference, the UN conference on uh, sustainable development, which uh, happened 20 years after the Earth uh, Summit. 
And this was around three years into my time as UNDP administrator. And from then on, a very significant amount of time was devoted by UNDP and by me uh, personally into supporting the design of the SDGs and then uh, their early uh, implementation. Uh, UNDP itself hosted an SDG hub, which other agencies seconded people uh, into, and we worked collaboratively to support national consultations on SDGs around the 2014 uh, uh, period, uh, global consultations, thematic consultations, an online survey called My World, uh, which eventually got 10 million responses, which asked people to rank what their priorities for the SDGs were. And, uh, well, no surprise, the top three uh, issues always came out as health, education and jobs, and number four was good governance because uh, so many people uh, realise that if your govern government doesn't have capabilities, development doesn't uh, go terribly far. Uh, now, when you think back to 2015, the year the goals were developed, uh, really this was a, a high water mark uh, for uh, setting uh, global development agendas. There was this uh, monumental agenda uh, there was the Paris Climate Agreement that was agreed December that year. There was a new framework for disaster risk reduction, which is an incredibly important contribution uh, to sustainable uh, development. And there was also a new framework on uh, international financing for development uh, agreed at uh, Addis Ababa at the third international conference on financing for development. And there was one more major agreement that followed in 2016 and that was the new urban agenda calling for inclusive, safe, resilient and sustainable cities, which was agreed at Quito in uh, Ecuador. But since 2015, rather a lot has happened in our world, uh, not least major political change in key capitals, which is not at all conducive to any of the agendas that I've just uh, mentioned. And given that climate change represents one of the greatest challenges to achieving the SDGs, it is of huge significance when the world's largest economy and only superpower gives notice of its intention to withdraw from the Paris Agreement. And when a Brazilian president uh, encourages the expansion of farming into the Amazon rainforest, quite disastrous as we see on our TV screens every night. Now, at the end of this month, uh, the world leaders will convene again at the UN uh, General Assembly High Level Week, and there will be a series of major summits related to sustainable development. A specific one on the SDGs, which is billed as a leader level summit of the high level political forum on the SDGs, and there'll also be one on uh, climate, there'll be a follow up conference on the uh, Samoa Pathway, which sets the sustainable development agenda for the small island developing uh, states. There'll be a universal health coverage summit, and there'll be uh, one reviewing progress on the Addis Ababa uh, financing uh, agenda. Uh, the UN Secretary General said several months ago of the climate summit uh, that when leaders come, uh, please don't come with a speech, come with a plan. And the same thing could be said of what they bring to all the other summits, including the uh, SDG one. Because there is growing concern at the lack of traction on achieving the SDGs at the global level. For example, on poverty eradication. The goal is eradication by 2030. But there are now serious forecasts that suggest that far from achieving that, we could still, by 2030, see uh, up to 6% of the world's population, and that could be up to 475 million people uh, living under the $1.91 uh, extreme, a, a day extreme poverty line. Hunger eradication is also a target for 2030, and yet each year, the last three years, the World Food Program has been reporting that there are growing numbers of hungry people in the world. Now standing at over 820 million, that's about one in nine of every human being on Earth. On education, uh, well, as was said in the introduction, I currently chair the advisory board for the UNESCO Global Education Monitoring Report, 
which looks at progress on this. Basic target in the SDGs, every six to 17 year olds shall enjoy uh, 12 years education by 2030. On current trends, one in every six children will miss that. So none of this is good. And the list could go on. And to it, of course, must be added the absolutely woeful state of biodiversity and the climate ecosystem. And these, in turn, exacerbate the vulnerability of the world's uh, poorest uh, people. As well, we have the level of forced displacement caused by war and conflict. That's at record levels, now standing at over 70 million. On the worst case scenario for climate change, which may well be realistic at the current rate of progress, the World Bank is estimating that another 143 million people in sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and Latin America uh, will be displaced. And that is not counting the uh, many millions of vulnerable uh, in uh, South and Southeast Asia. So these are very significant challenges to sustainable development at the global level. And they need a concerted response and they need a focus on the most vulnerable. So it's all the more concerning that the latest OECD figures on development assistance show a decline overall of 2.7% in ODA from 2017 to 18, with aid to Africa falling by 4%. The climate finance promised by developed countries is falling well short of where it should be, and that matters enormously for both adaptation and mitigation, particularly in the poorest countries. I've always seen the SDGs as a bold and visionary agenda, which if implemented, as I said, would bring about transformational change. But currently, the world is rather off track for that great outcome. International solidarity will continue to be very important for the poorest countries, indeed absolutely essential if poverty and hunger are to be banished by 2030, and if other basic human development goals in the SDG agenda are to be reached. But here's where we need the joined up thinking. These goals can't be met if the environment continues to be pillaged. Last week, the head of the Secretariat for the UN Convention on Biodiversity expressed her concern that we're moving towards tipping points which should, could produce, and she used the phrase, cascading collapses of natural ecosystems. Think about it, cascading collapses of natural ecosystems. There was the UN report in May that warned that a million species are on the verge of extinction. Pledges on climate action as of late last year put the world on track for three degrees warming by the end of the century, which is far above the 1.5 degree aspiration of the Paris Agreement. And this has very serious implications for countries rich and poor, including our own. So at the UN summits in New York later next month, the world leaders do have the opportunity to face up to these scenarios and determine to make a course correction. Uh, I think more development support for the poorest and more climate action across the board would be a very good start. So, can New Zealand lead on this? Yes, it can, at home and abroad. It has stepped up off a low base on development assistance, and the government has agreed on its framework for climate change policy, uh, aimed at reducing greenhouse gas emissions and building climate resilience. There is the zero carbon bill before parliament. Ideally, it does need cross-party support to spare New Zealand from the stop-go approach which it has had to climate action over the last two decades. Overall, my assessment is that New Zealand's strategies and policy approaches currently are not inconsistent, not inconsistent with what is needed to make progress on the sustainable development goals. But our country has yet to formally adopt an SDG strategy and targets, as the recent People's Report prepared by civil society organisations points out. So New Zealand leadership on the SDGs would be enhanced
by moving to embrace a formal strategy with targets and a commitment to monitoring and accountability, in line with the approach of so many other countries around the world. So let's hope today's discussions will help define how New Zealand can move forward on the SDGs and help contribute to the global momentum and action, which is very badly needed right now. Thank you. Thank you, Helen, for providing what we expected you would, rather than uh, a grandiose and glorious speech, rather uh, points of action um, and uh, the motivation and um, an encouragement to, uh, to make some of the changes that you encourage us to do. And to do further, uh, we would now like to invite uh, members of our taumata, our very first panel for this morning. Um, and I'm not too sure if you've arrived, Russell. Russell, you've arrived? Okay, fantastic. So if I could call Jacqueline, Russell, and Rachel uh, down to the panel, down to the taumata. Hi, I'm Jeff Sachs. I'm director of the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network and also SDG advocate for UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres. I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to say hello to you on this second New Zealand SDG Summit. Congratulations to all of you for your leadership. Congratulations to the University of Auckland and the Auckland University of Technology, two great institutions that are co-hosting this event. And I'm thrilled uh, to be a small part of it. Thank you for the invitation. New Zealand uh, is a leader in the world. We look to New Zealand for its leadership. As you know, New Zealand is one of the best performing countries in the sustainable development goals in the world. I co-edit the annual SDG index and dashboards report. And in the 2019 report, New Zealand ranks uh, 11th in the world, uh, about 160 countries. This is very, very good, and you should uh, be very much encouraged. Maybe even uh, happier news for you is that in the World Happiness Report that I also co-edit, for the United Nations. New Zealand in 2019 ranks eighth. New Zealand is, uh, on the whole, a happy and successful country. But the truth is, as you know very well, no single country, even the top ranked countries, are not on track to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Climate Agreement. And not because we can't. Uh, New Zealand is a rich, prosperous country that can achieve all of the SDGs and can achieve the decarbonization needed uh, to uh, stay within the limits set in the Paris Climate Agreement. It's a matter of strategy. It's a matter of planning. It's a matter of expertise, such as the host institutions offer to New Zealand society. Uh, it's, of course, a, a matter of our individual understanding and uh, volition as well. In a rich world, there's no excuse for the dangers that we are causing ourselves uh, with uh, human-induced climate change. And there's no excuse in a rich world to have people still struggling in abject poverty or lacking uh, basic economic needs or more than 200 million kids worldwide out of school, there is simply no excuse. Well, you're going to solve these problems for New Zealand, help to orient your wonderful country to achieve the SDGs and the Paris Climate Agreement. And let me say thank you to your inspiring Prime Minister. Uh, Prime Minister Ardern 
is respected worldwide and her leadership is respected worldwide. And her contribution and her government's contribution this year with a 2019 well-being budget is being watched with enormous interest and on my part, a lot of jealousy <laughs> being in the United States uh, with this great contribution. As all of you know, the well-being budget prioritizes uh, five areas in New Zealand, uh, mental health, child poverty, the indigenous peoples of rights and needs, decarbonization, and uh, flourishing in the digital age. These are all of them, every one of them, sustainable development goals and the idea of orienting the national budget directly in this way, a well-being budget, uh, measuring life satisfaction as one of the key indicators for government in the days and years ahead is extremely important. <coughs> Let me point out the areas where New Zealand has some work to do, though what our index shows of some serious challenges that New Zealand faces. One is surprisingly on public health. New Zealand, uh, like my own country, which is a bit worse, has an obesity epidemic, which is mainly the result of our fast food industry deregulated, putting forward to our children, <coughs> to the society, unhealthy foods. And this is a heavy burden on well-being, on causing disease, on premature death. Uh, so this is an area where New Zealand definitely needs to do some work, and I believe that regulating the fast food industry is a major starting point. A second area that I would stress is decarbonization. New Zealand already gets most of its power from zero carbon energy, but is still a major emitter of fossil fuel uh, CO2 and also, uh, more generally, of uh, greenhouse gases from the agriculture sector. So New Zealand has a lot of work to do to get to zero net emissions. Most of all, in my view, this requires a national plan. I would really encourage uh, the universities to get together and work with government on a serious engineering-based national strategy to get to zero by 2050. A third area that New Zealand uh, needs is much greater effort on conservation of biodiversity. As you know, uh, many species in New Zealand, uh, endemic to New Zealand, are on the IUCN red list. Uh, New Zealand is uh, at risk of losing uh, major biomes, uh, wetlands, and uh, major species that are unique to your very beautiful country. A last area that I would like to make an appeal is New Zealand's uh, contributions to the SDGs through development assistance. New Zealand is a rich and a generous people, but the level of development aid as a share of gross national product falls far short of the global target of 0.7% of GDP. In a rich world, with still a billion abjectly poor people and more than 200 million kids out of school, we need development aid. If I could suggest, uh, New Zealand could use its development aid to help promote the concepts of well-being budgets. Uh, the development aid could help other countries to orient their budgets to achieve the sustainable development goals. Well, I think I've uh, talked too long for the uh, short message that you invited me to give. Let me congratulate you again. Let me tell you how much we admire your country. We want to see you even higher on the SDG list and the happiness list. We know that your well-being budget is going to help get you there. And we really want to see New Zealand solve these uh, remaining uh, tough problems and also to help lead the world with your wonderful example to solve these problems all over the world. All best wishes on a hugely successful SDG Summit. Thank you so much. Um, we come to our first taumata today, ladies and gentlemen, our first um, panel session, um, and it is my privilege uh, to 
uh, welcome each of our panellists. Uh, we will be treated uh, by Jacqueline first, then by Russell, uh, and then by Rachel um, to add to those messages of um, encouragement and, um, and to take leadership roles, um, to add to those which were offered to us by, by Helen uh, this morning. Uh, first uh, panellist this morning is Dr. Jacqueline Parisi. Um, Jacqueline supports the Council for International Development in the areas of strategy, planning and business development. As an executive of the Impact uh, Effect, her focus is strengthening not-for-profit organisations and building social enterprises. Recent projects uh, have seen her working in Thailand, uh, the Lao People's Democratic Republic, Cambodia, China, Myanmar, New Zealand and Indonesia. Jacqueline has held executive leadership roles in the private, public and development aid sectors and in, the international, and in international consulting firms. Uh, she also uh, supervises doctoral candidates engaged in academic research. For my tapaki paki mo Jacqueline. Good morning. Uh, I'm told I've got five minutes to say what I've got to say, uh, which is quite a challenge because I really have so much to say. But I'll try and keep it short. So, at SID, so we see so many sectors contributing to the SDGs, but not necessarily in a purposeful manner. Four years ago, title, uh, research titled Are the Rich Countries Ready? outlined an assessment of richer countries' preparedness for the SDGs. The report identified several strengths for New Zealand, but also several weaknesses, including the high obesity rates we've spoken of this morning, poor education for some low socioeconomic groups, and inefficient usage of, usage of energy. So, how are we doing as a nation now, four years later? Well. As we know, in sport and in business, New Zealand punches well above its weight. Yet it seems, it matter, where it matters even more, we seem to be less focused. We're currently ranked 11th on the world SDG league table. Okay, so given this is out of 162, you might think this is a pretty good result. However, I believe we should really be showing more collective commitment and passion and be aspiring to a top three spot currently held by Denmark, Sweden and Finland. Also, we may think we're making a real contribution, but according to Vic University's interactive data model, since 2015 there's been little measurable change. With the exception of drastic improvement in climate action, well done, um, and a slight improvement in no poverty, no other SDGs have improved. And gender equality has reportedly gone slightly backwards. But measurement's complex. To measure progress here in New Zealand, we have no less than five constructs to consider. They're the 17 uh, global SDGs themselves with their 169 targets and their evolving list of 244 um, indicators. We have the New Zealand Living Standards Framework. We've got the Living Standards Framework dashboard for the outcomes, our people, our country, our future. Then there are the IANZ metrics. And of course, there's also the Voluntary National Review. So, linkages have been designed between these instruments, but they're not yet fully operative. Some linkages are more loose than others, and some of the SDGs aren't actually covered. The intention is to map the, S the living standards to the SDGs, but it's not clear whether the mapping will demonstrate just alignment or whether it will actually measure contribution. So I confess to being a little bit confused as to understanding how we'll really know that we've, we've achieved them. The multi-pronged approach appears to be a little unscientific. And as a nation, how involved are we in the whole SDG dialogue? 
At the government level, there's definitely engagement, evidenced by the resources allocated to such things as the Living Standards Framework and the other constructs mentioned. But what's happening at a regional Pacific level? It's true, New Zealand's international aid is highly cognizant of and aligned with the SDG agenda. Having said this, SID's annual survey indicates that many of our members who are probably among the most SDG aware in the country are, in response to the SDGs, really only changing the language they use. But that's not what I really mean when I say what's happening at a regional Pacific level. While New Zealand is definitely assisting Pacific neighbors address priorities, I'm interested in regional collaboration and synchronization is like what synchronization is taking place across the region, across the Pacific. Are we leveraging regional opportunities for synergy? Is there an opportunity to work with the Pacific and find a way to collectively contribute and measure SDG impact across the region? Impact's not contained to tidy countries. It drifts across borders into neighboring countries. So does it not make sense to collaborate regionally and at the same time role model globally how regions can work together for the good of our planet, leaving no one behind? And at a public level, are the people of New Zealand really aware of the SDGs and of New Zealand's role and performance in this journey? I was speaking to a well-educated, middle-aged friend a few nights ago. Um, he had no idea what the SDGs were. So just how engaged as a country and a region are we? With the goal of leaving no one behind, is the process itself in danger of doing just that? So to conclude, I think I'm nearly up to five minutes, but to conclude, I believe the potential lies in three areas. First, leadership. SDGs aren't designed for politicians, but require political leadership. We need to have targets, one way to measure them, politicize them, get behind them, and do them. Secondly, participation. The leaders need to engage the people of New Zealand in the importance of the SDGs and inspire people to care about them. And all sectors need to be engaged in the journey. And thirdly, lastly, partnerships. Let's revitalize partnerships for the SDGs and ensure regional collaboration. Let's demonstrate to the rest of the world SDG leadership and together secure a top three spot in the SDG index. Thank you. Tēnā koe, Jacqueline. Uh, we're privileged also to have with us this morning, this morning's panel, uh, Russell Norman. Uh, Russell is the Executive Director of Greenpeace Aotearoa New Zealand, and prior to this, he was a member of the New Zealand Parliament and co-leader of the Green Party during its period of growth leading up to 2004, the 2014 election. Russell was the party spokesperson on economics and environment and development uh, of the party's economic policy. He has a PhD in political science and his areas of expertise include economics, climate, energy and freshwater ecosystems. Kia ora, Russell. Uh, tēnā koutou. Uh, greetings to Ngāti Katoa, Uraki, uh, mana whenua of this place. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction. I always think it's funny how you get to write your own introduction. I could have written anything in there. It would have been fantastic. So, um, so uh, basically, um, uh, I'm from Greenpeace, so I, so I work in global uh, climate change stuff and biodiversity. Um, and so when you look at the issues, the, the great issue of climate change, which threatens to wipe out the gains in pretty much every other area, um, one of the key things that, that is really apparent right at the start is we need more global cooperation. Uh, we need more global governance. Uh, we, we can't solve a problem like climate change by ourselves, um, no matter how good we are. 
number 11 or number 8 uh, in happiness. <clears throat> so, I, so in terms of the contributing to the number 8 in happiness, I'm not helping out there, right? Okay. So, um, uh, because we can't solve this problem unless we have more global cooperation. Now, you'd think uh, that the world would be awash with support for globalization. I mean, we've had uh, 30 years now of, of globalization and the promotion of globalization. You couldn't escape it. Um, it was part of the official doctrine of most governments in the West over the last 35 years or so. Um, and yet, we find that in a world which is desperate for more global cooperation, we have the rise of the opposite. Uh, we have a rise of nationalism, we have a rise of xenophobia, and we have a series of key governments now around the world who are turning their back on global projects. So why is it that after 35 years of this amazing globalization project led by the party of Davos, uh, the global elites who meet each year in Davos, the party of Davos, as Steve Bannon calls it, who's uh, one of Donald Trump's um, key advisors, why is it that after 35 years of the party of Davos telling us all that globalization is a great thing, there's not that much support for it? And the answer is not very hard to find. The reason is, is that when you go to the United States, there's still dramatic poverty, right? When you go to the, this country, this amazingly rich country. 40% um, uh, or thereabouts of American families, if they were said, uh, do you have four, 400 bucks because your car's broken down, they'd have to borrow the money to pay the bill. Um, and yet at the same time, when we look globally, there is a massive concentration of wealth in the top 1% of the global population, or even less than 1%. So after 35 years of this amazing globalization, what we find is that there is this massive concentration of wealth, and there are great swathes of the middle class, as they used to be called, but they're just working class people in the United States and other places, who still, uh, their lives are more precarious than ever. Their wages are lower than ever. Their wages have either stagnated or they've gone, they haven't gone anywhere, uh, that, uh, or they've gone down. Um, and and, and their, their lives are more, more precarious than ever. More people at age 70 in the United States are declaring for bankruptcy than ever before. So are we surprised that middle class, working class people around the world have rejected this neoliberal globalization that has been offered to us? So what I would say is if we want the global cooperation that we so desperately need, we need a different kind of globalization. We need a different kind of globalism. We can't have what we've just been through because it has discredited globalization. It has been globalization for the party of Davos, for the wealthy, for the rich, and ordinary people have not benefited from that. So it's hardly surprising that an anti-establishment candidate like Donald Trump, at least that's how he presents himself, an anti-establishment candidate like Donald Trump was able to find a ready audience amongst those people. Um, and it's not just that, we've also, neoliberal globalization has institutionalized a whole bunch of structures that make it hard to do what we need to do on climate change. The state of Hamburg tried to stop a coal-fired power station. It was blocked because the company that was trying to do it sued them through a trade agreement, an investor agreement. Um, when Obama tried to block the Keystone XL pipeline, he was sued by the company under the North American Free Trade Agreement. Right, because it said it would lose, it would lose money about it. Um, when the states in, in Canada tried to stop fracking, they were sued under the North American Free Trade Agreement. These trade agreements, which have become the de facto high level of globalization, neoliberal globalization, are making it harder for us to deal with global problems because they're not designed to protect the climate, they're not designed to protect us, they're designed to protect corporations. So we need to explicitly reject that kind of corporate neoliberal globalization and rebuild a real globalization that actually protects the climate. It says to companies, if you are going to lose money because we're going to save the climate, tough luck. We need to overturn those kind of investor state dispute settlement procedures and that kind of neoliberal globalization in order to rebuild the kind of global cooperation and the real globalization of people that we need. Thank you. Russell. Uh, we're fortunate next to have in our midst uh, Rachel uh, Lemessurier, 
uh, and Rachel is the director, executive director of Oxfam New Zealand. Uh, she has worked in leadership roles in the United Kingdom, New Zealand and in the Pacific uh, for over 27 years, primarily amongst community-based based, uh, community -based NGO providers. Uh, her areas of expertise include women's advocacy, access to social welfare, health and legal services, and protection of human rights, particularly in relation to sexual and reproductive health, HIV, disability, and gender. Kill Rich. Tenakoto, tenakoto, tenakoto katoa, na mihi kui katoa. Um, I wish to particularly greet you all. I want to greet and acknowledge Ngāti Whātua, uh, Mana Whenua, and their tipuna for the guardianship uh, kaitiaki of uh, the, the whenua here, I think which is something we're all very grateful for and I think we're going to draw down on a need uh, look going into the future. My name is Rachel Limasurie. I grew up in the Waikato. My awa is the Waikato. My maunga is Mangatauteri. Um, I've been the ED of Oxfam New Zealand now for over five years and uh, am very, very delighted to be on this panel um, as the opening session for the New Zealand SDG session. It'll be no surprise that for Oxfam the international context is front and centre and we've have, we have very significant focus on SDG 1, SDG 5, 6, 8, 10 and 13 and now I'm going to wonder how do I move the next slide? Oh, the mouse? Um, but for us, this Fokotoki is probably the, the most important one, and it summarises the meaning of SDG 17. When we paddle in unison, when we work together, we do believe that this is the actual underlying premise of SDG 17. And the context of this panel, it's very much around what is the international context. Um, and for us, that's very much about recognising both the current and the potential role for the New Zealand um, government and New Zealand's leadership. But noting very much that under uh, SDG 17 and this panel, we're, we've been challenged to ask uh, or to look into the future a little and see what are the emerging um, trends, some of the, 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 the challenges that are both with us now and, and coming, uh, coming down the road towards us. And Oxfam's been developing um, a range of scenarios over the last couple of months uh, that are looking at those very things, at the very global challenges. Um, and I wanted to share those with you as part of a way to, to generate a discussion about these five scenarios that have been brought together by 10,000 of my colleagues, hundreds of our partner organisations um, all around the world. And fundamental to these scenarios is that each and every SDG is interconnected. That we actually need a systems approach to the complexity that these scenarios are proposing for us. And really recognising that what the same time as good stuff can and will happen, at the same time as bad stuff is going to happen, and nothing will remain static. So let me give you a whistle-stop tour in view of the fact that I've got two minutes left and how does that happen. Um, the first one up is obviously climate change and that's very much about recognising that there is going to be increasing conflict and divergent responses of government, communities, women and youth movements and the private sector to the climate emergency and to the progress on SDG 13 itself. Who might win and lose these battles? how those, the, those in power may try and find solutions and for whom, and how power could shift between different actors. These will be uppermost as progressive governments try to progress um, uh, keeping us below the 1.5 degrees warming. Second one is very much the movement of people. And as we see, whether it is um, from rural areas or outer islands, from places of conflict, climate destruction, political oppression, economic inequality, people will be on the move for safety, food, better opportunities and quality of life. This is already driving rapid demographic changes, class divisions, xenophobia, racism and poverty. These will put a burden on resources, but particularly within and across developing countries. Technology and human rights. One of those areas where there's both progress and there's extraordinary challenges. Large multinational technology companies will wield more power, 
blurring the lines between nation states and corporations and seeking to decrease people's agency and civic space. However, their power is increasingly being challenged by active citizens who are using technology to mobilise people in various movements, both on the right and on the left. Shifting global order. Now, increasingly, it's highly probable that global and national institutions are, are becoming dysfunctional, undermining the existing rules-based global value system and norms. This is going to be a major challenge to progressive governments who want to strengthen the implementation of SDGs. Lastly, in these five scenarios is inequality and the abuse of power. Power grows in the hands of authoritarian governments, corporations and anti-rights actors. However, counter-movements are also growing. We are seeing this. Feminist, Black Lives Move Matter, youth and community activism also growing. What we are seeing is a democracy and the ballot box at local, regional, national and multinational levels will be increasingly tested. While many of us will be looking to this leadership, what we have to acknowledge is we also have this leadership. This is our coalition government. For us to acknowledge and recognise what the Prime Minister said in her speech, that New Zealand has this commitment to being a leader, being part of the global effort to create sustainable and inclusive economies, having a deeper understanding of those most affected, that it's not achievable by governments alone. We also want to recognise that to do this in a time of such radical, volatile change, we need an SDG minister in Cabinet, a significant signal to New Zealanders that SDGs are mattering to this government, and to have that SDG uh, that minister and the responsibility for the SDG response in the department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet. There is literally no more higher or senior role. We also need our government to be a progressive nation to ensure that, it, uh, sorry, a progressive voice to protect the SDGs legitimacy, which we are going to see under increasing threat and the global multi multilateral system. To be part of that global effort, as Jeffrey Sachs said, we've got to do better on our ODA. We are moving, but we've got to have a timeline so we know when we're going to get to point seven. We've got to in increase the ODA's focus on poverty reduction, resource mobilisation, and developing an aid for trade strategy well overdue. If we are going to have a deeper understanding of those most affected, We've got to make sure we have a real focus on reducing violence against women and children. Half of the world's um, population, we've got to also look at the marginalised uh, women and girls in that context. This is not going to be achievable unless we make sure, as, she, as uh, the Prime Minister has said, that we're all included in this waka. We must ensure that we include iwi and Māori leadership at the global level, as well as civil society, private sector and academia. Lastly, we need an international development cooperation policy. And thank you so much for your patience holding up the stop sign. Thank you all. Jackie, Russell, Norman, Rachel, Etifaya um, Hokia, Helen, uh, those of you, while you're still sitting on your seats in the waka, uh, we now have some questions for you, which will um, discern, shall we say, given the, the, uh, the brief period of time we have left in this session via Slido. So thank you to those who contributed questions. Thank you. Um, so my name is Maria DeRosha, and I am actually the SDG site editor and administrator, currently the only one on our very small team. And Dr. Jacqueline actually mentioned um, very briefly when she was speaking about our tool that is data-based. It's a data visualization that does negate our impression of progress towards each of these individual SDGs, goals, indicators based on data collected, working with Statistics New Zealand, OECD reports, et cetera, um, essentially showing that not only do we have a striking lack of data, but also that it hasn't changed in its trajectory much over time. So my question um, was asked basically just in the interest of getting that information out there for people to interact with and see, you know, where is it coming from, this model that shows we don't have as much progress as we'd like. Uh, so my question was admittedly, what is the SDG tool by Vic University that negates our impression of progress? Where is it found? Um, just because I really would like everyone in the audience 
to have that information available to them. So thank you. I apologize that it wasn't a direct question to the panel. So yes. Just in response, the issue of data has been one of the most discussed in the development of the SDGs and then in discussion about implementation. And of course, uh, first thing, you do need a strategy, you do need targets, you do need indicators, and then you need to measure progress. Now, what was apparent from a very early stage of the SDGs was that actually no country had access to the information it required to measure progress. So there has to be a huge upskilling uh, in the official statistics collections across countries rich and poor. Uh, one of the jobs the UN system was doing in capital in developing countries was to help build statistical office uh, capacity. And that is a very worthy uh, endeavor, by the way, for uh, official development assistance agencies to build that capacity to collect uh, and, and monitor data. But another uh, point that was always made was that data then has to be presented in a form that's accessible so that civil society can use it. Because with monitoring, it's not only official monitoring, it's also civil society, the media, parliamentarians keeping an eye on, on what is happening. And clearly to get traction on this in New Zealand, we would be, have to be much more structured. Better official statistics, stats working with efforts like the very interesting one you're involved with uh, at Victoria, uh, upskilling and supporting civil society organisations. One last point. The International Organization of Auditors General uh, came down with a decision from its conference about two, three years ago, calling on every audit office in the world to develop tools for auditing progress on national SDG progress. So all this has got traction out there, and, and it would be great to see a push out of a conference like this one and all your efforts assembled here uh, to get that moving in New Zealand. By Helen. Uh, Slido is working now, Fano. So um, perhaps, uh, well, let's go for this meaty question right here, the one right at the top. Um, what can younger people, students, do to help? And I think that's an appropriate question given we're here at a university. Kilda. Kilda, and um, great question. Um, I've just uh, finished seven. Um, uh, local city events across the country around particularly climate breakdown. And this was one of the questions that the, the, in every single one, Dunedin, Nelson, Christchurch, Tauranga, Hamilton, out of the audience came, yes, but what can we do? Whether you're a student, whether you're in, in, the, in the workforce. And I think one of the, the best answers came from um, a wonderful young woman called Timmy in the Waikato, who's part of the school strike. And what she actually said to that question was, just do something. Just do something. Now, what she meant was take a small action, whatever that may mean. It may mean joining, uh, going on the school strike on the 27th of September, for example. Every form of, of collective action that we take is actually part of uh, a progress on the SDGs. And many of those collective actions, this is presuming they're progressive collective actions, um, are actually connected up to those key issues, whether it's inequality, whether it's tax justice, whether it's climate breakdown. Um, so as students, whether it's within your, your, your home, your how you get to school, how you get to uni, what you do in your class, what the class is studying, what you, how you're engaging um, with each other socially, all of this is such a key part of progressing SDGs and obviously your degree. The more, academic, more skilled and talented, knowledgeable people we've got coming out of universities who have integrated their degree work in with the SDGs is going to be hugely helpful. I think just building on what Rachel said, um, also youth and uh, students, I think, have a great role to play in the advocacy of SDGs. And as I said, like. I, I have middle-aged friends who actually don't know what the SDGs are. I suspect more young people do know than, than people of our age bracket. But um, so I think just talk to as many people as you can about it and integrate it into what you're studying and the way you're, you're communicating and just, um, yeah, just keep the dialogue moving. Thank you. Here's a rather, rather topical one. Does anyone on the panel have an opinion on New Zealand declaring a climate emergency? 
sure of. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, we should do it, right? But more than that, we should actually do something um, to cut our emissions. So, um, you know, uh, so just answering the last question, September 27, like there's a, there's, there's a big national action, there's a global action that week. So if we keep doing what we're doing, we are going to have a climate catastrophe, right? That, that's, what, that's, that's what we're on path for. So we have to disrupt this system. Right, because this system will deliver four degrees of warming by the end of the century if it carries on. That's what it's going to deliver, right? So we have to disrupt it. So come to the thing on September 27, organise a whole bunch of other people. Climate emergency, yeah, let's have a climate emergency, let's declare it. We do, it is an emergency, no question about it. But more importantly, we must change the policies so that we cut our emissions. And just one more uh, question, and while we have the privilege of a former Prime Minister among us this morning, um, Helen Clark, what are some of the standout actions you've seen around the world which have bent upwards the negative trajectory of SDG achievements? Well, I, I think there's, there's two big issues. One is what's happening to uh, the climate, and the, the other is uh, the extent of, of war and conflict, not just formal conflict, but also the... Um, uh, the societies that are completely mired in civil insecurity, high levels of gang violence, and, and so on. I mean, take, for example, the scenes we see played out on the US southern border. Why are people leaving Central America? It is a combination of, of actually climate change at work. There's a lot of uh, uh, writing now about the, the drought in the region, uh, which, is, which is really affecting the subsistence small farming. Uh, but also you have huge inequality, uh, huge poverty, uh, and societies wrecked by gang warfare. So put these together, you have the perfect storm on the, on the US southern border. What's the US's reward <laughs> to cut development aid, you know, because the people won't stop migrating? I mean, this is, this is ridiculous. Uh, but uh, overall, uh, if you have a world in which 70 million are forcibly displaced, uh, by conflict, the spillover effects of that are, are very, very significant, not least in the humanitarian response that has to happen, because you're talking lives, health, well-being, water, food, uh, that then becomes a, a charge against what is available for longer term uh, development. So it, it is like a perfect storm what we're, what we're in at the moment, and to see Wars like the Syrian one, the Yemen one, the, the, the Libyan conflict, perpetrated essentially by proxies who are standing behind uh, the warring par parties is very, very distress it's distressing. So you know, the voices of small progressive countries like New Zealand are needed on, on these issues uh, to, to stop us careering towards a, a number of tipping points, the climate tipping point, the, the, the biodiversity uh, tipping point, the, you know, the tipping point where it becomes impossible to eradicate extreme poverty because we're not dealing with the underlying issues. E te whaia, Helen, tēnā koe, a tēnā koutou. A round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, for our panellists this morning.